most of the talking, otherwise I might just babble. <laughs> J.R. Weaver, welcome back, sir. Glad to have you on the show again. And if he tells you that he has been banned from the show, he is a dirty liar. Fresh fresh off my exile from the uh-huh. RL show. Uh-huh. Sure, sure. Like Keep to say, big thanks to Leonard Lee Bouchel for coming on tonight. I mean, we, I had the honor and the privilege of, of hanging out with him in L.A. a few weeks ago. Hey, Amazing everyone. dude. Good evening. Good evening. Yeah, a little, uh, little last minute switcheroo. Mm-hmm. Did yep, you say switcheroo? Yep. Yeah. Oh, twitch now switcheroo. Switcheroo. <laughs> yeah, I'm replacing somebody, aren't I? I'm like I'm, I'm sloppy seconds. You're the VIP <laughs> man. It's all about you tonight. Okay. No, that's not what that's not what I was trying to imply. But I was, you know, the the yeah, I didn't have time to change the title or anything, so. People are gonna be priest's collar here. Let me straighten it out. <laughs> okay. We got a bunch of people in the comments. Comments Tanya. already? Get the f- <laughs> <laughs> get this. In case you haven't heard of Len- uh, Leonard, he is the you're the creator of the Real Recovery Film Festival, right? I the am. I'm also the editor of the Addiction Recovery eBulletin, available free every Tuesday morning. Sign up and pres- pres- prescribe. I mean, subscribe. AddictionRecoveryEBulletin.org. <laughs> it's also a website. Okay, maybe we could put the uh, link in the uh, the thread. Yeah. But I'm really here because you wanted me to talk about this. Exactly. This book. Hi, Confessions of a Cannabis Addict by Leonard Lee Michel. I got some blowback on the title. A friend in Philadelphia said, Cannabis Addict? I said, yeah. He says, I've been smoking pot every day for 50 years. I can stop whenever I want. (laughs) It's okay. Yeah, that's what we all say until we try to stop. Mm. Not that easy. Ooh. Ooh, congratulations, Paul Martinez. 1,306 days clean and sober. Bravo. Yeah, I just hit uh, five years, November 10th. To... Congratulations. Big five. So, Leonard, you want to tell us about the book? The book? You want, to, you want to read some out of it? I'll read something. Sure. I thought you were going to interrogate me first, <laughs> but I can I can read a little something. Uh, yeah. Okay. How about this uh, this little section when uh, when I was young, a young man, I was uh, smoking a lot of hashish, and for you younger viewers. It's a better version of marijuana because it's sweeter and it's condensed and it doesn't make you choke. Uh, There's several kinds of hashish, and maybe this is going to become a tutorial. There is the Tibetan temple balls, obviously from Tibet. There's also black Pakistani hash, uh, also very smooth, very excellent. There's Moroccan Keith, K-I-F, I think that's why they called Keith Richards Keith. Uh, I don't know if that was the English accent or he just smoked a lot of Keith. Uh, And then, of course, one of my favorites was red Lebanese hash. And there was a moment in time in Philadelphia and New York and basically up and down the East Coast uh, where I was working sort of, you know, part-time, full-time as a a drug dealer. 
And my friend and I realized we couldn't buy any hashish because nobody had any. And we panicked and we thought, how can we survive? How can we literally live? How can we take our next breath if it doesn't include some kind of hashish product? So we looked on a map and we saw that Lebanon was right north of Israel. And we thought, well, we'll go to Israel. And, and I'm sure there's some camels or donkeys smuggling some into the country and we'll go and we'll bring some back because we need to get high every day. And we did. We flew nonstop from Kennedy to Tel Aviv. It was like the one of the longest flights in the world at that time. It was 13 hours nonstop. Uh, we got to, to Israel, got out of the airport, got to a taxi, and suddenly there was a double rainbow. We thought this is going to be a great trip. There's a double rainbow. So we knew we were on the beam, got into town, rented a car, and just explored the country. Our, our family, our families thought we were going to Israel to discover our roots. Our friends thought we were going to go smuggling to make money, but actually we were just going for a stash. We just, we just needed hashish. Uh, and the last day we were there, well, we had managed to find some, we bought some, they came in 200. There's a picture of it actually in the, in the book. Those are 200 gram little bricklets wrapped in a very thin, fine, expensive canvas. Wow. Uh, we, we got those and they're 200 grams each and we realized uh, we, could, we could put them in our pants and fly back to New York and, and have uh, a really decent stash. Uh, so what we did was uh, we did that. So... I'll just pick up here. It's uh, page eighty. It's page sixty-one for all of you following along at home who already own the book. By the way, I have a special offer. If you buy the book on Amazon uh, and send me or post a picture of you and the book, I'll send you a second copy so you can give one away uh, to a friend or a family member or maybe someone who you think is smoking too much pot. And I don't think you can smoke too much pot. I just think you can smoke pot for too long. I mean, after 20 years, I think it's, it's, it's diminishing returns. You know, I always called it a, a young person's drug. But if you've been smoking for 20, 30 years, 40 years, are you really still getting high or are you just maintaining the THC levels in your blood? Because if you don't have it, you'll, you can't sleep and you'll, you'll be in a funk uh, and you'll get headaches. So be that as it may, uh, this is us. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, okay, so uh, to make this trip, we had taken off a semester from our studies at the Philadelphia Community College. You know, we said we were actually, you know, we dropped out of college. We thought we would go back, but we never did. So where we spent more time focusing on getting high than actually achieving a higher education. Uh, our return flight was in three weeks when we would be cruising through the New York airport named after our most recently assassinated, uh, assassinated, what was uh, our most recently assassinated and much beloved president. Both of us returned to the U.S. with 600 grams of hashish stuffed in our pants. Well, not exactly in our pants. The night before the flight home, we went to a ladies intimate apparel store on the main drag in Tel Aviv and purchased three flesh toned girdles. They were not the whalebone rib crushers with leather laces, but the thigh to rib cage, super slim, kind of popular with women who wanted to appear more svelte. I'm buying this for my girlfriend, I explained. She's built just like me. Uh, so was mine, said my accomplice in deception. The, the shop girls either took our word for it or they knew we were neophyte hash smugglers. The next morning, we helped each other slide the three 200-gram canvas-wrapped bricks into our girdles. 50 years ago, there was much less, meaning 50 years ago from now, there was much less security, even in Israel. The era, the era 
of skyjackings didn't start until 1971. We boarded our return flight unmolested and then realized we had both forgotten to buy a silver-plated mezuzah like normal tourists would. A half a day later, we were back in U.S. airspace. When the plane started to descend to Kennedy Airport, I leaned over Joe's lap to look out the window at the teeming populace of Long Island, 700 and I mean, seven and a half million people. From his crotch, I could smell the distinctly subtle aroma of red Lebanese hash rising into the stuffy airplane air. Subtle to humans, maybe, but like a runaway slave to a Confederate soldier or a customs inspector's German shepherd. We had talcum powder with us, and through my teeth, I said, you've got to go to the bathroom and use more talcum powder but don't let any fall out of your girdle and descend like snow out of your pant leg onto your floor shine shoes and leave a trail all the way to Rikers Island. Bringing in drugs from outside the country is serious business. It's called smuggling. I remember waiting in the customs line that I held my breath almost as often as I breathed. It wasn't anything floating in the air outside my nostrils that triggered the response. It was the fear deep inside my bones. The fear gripped me the whole time. The shepherds must have been having a lunch break when we came through. As I cleared customs, I could picture the ump behind home plate at Connie Mac Stadium yelling, safe. Joe got through, safe and sound also. Once I got back home, selling the hash was no problem until I was dealing my last quarter ounce to some guys in a friend's basement in the Kensington and Allegheny neighborhood of Philadelphia. Instead of reaching into their pockets and pulling out their money, they each reached into their belts and pulled out a handgun. One of them put a revolver to my head. The other pressed the 45 automatic to my heart. I remember looking at the revolver pressed at my temple, seeing bullets in all the chambers and deciding not to give them an article, an argument, or say anything funny. You know the expression, nervous laughter? Well, imagine frightened to death about the shit in my pants, nervous laughter. Yet I acted calm and non-threatening. I wanted them to feel happy, happy about their career choice and not trigger happy. Many thoughts went through my mind. The one I remember most vividly was, if I ever get an acting role that requires me to be scared to death, this experience will come in handy. Having done plenty of neighborhood theater, this thought was not as far-fetched as you would imagine. They took the hash plus the $200 I had with me and slowly walked me to my car. I wanted them to know that I wasn't going to panic or do something stupid. I also wanted them to know that I was taking them seriously and I wasn't making light of being ripped off. Deciding they were unconcerned with either issue, I kept my mouth shut. As I drove slowly off, tears started streaming down my face, realizing how my life could have come to an end during that loaded drama that I had just lived through. At that seminal moment, I came to a firm and unshakable re re realization and formed an irreversible resolve. Never again, I said to myself, I'm never selling drugs in that neighborhood ever again. So that was how dedicated I was. I called it going to, I didn't know what it was called then, but it was called going to any length to stay high. And it was, it was, uh, it turned out to be, and that was the sec. no, that was the first time. I went back a year later uh, with more grandiose plans that actually ended up working out really well. Uh, I never made a lot of money dealing, but I just lived a comfortable life and got to meet interesting people along the way. In the meantime, I was starting to nurse, obviously a serious cannabis habit. And years later, uh, I was at my, I, I, I never did white powders. And if you guys wanna throw in any questions, if you're still awake, please just let me know. In fact, I don't even know if you're still there. <laughs> yeah, we're still here. Tap, tap on something. I mean, yeah. uh, <laughs> cheers. This is not whiskey. Leonard, I don't know how you went through that airport. I, I would have been sweating bullets. Because I was high, I could do anything while I was high. 
<laughs> you don't sweat bullets if you think yeah. no you, you, you try not to i mean yeah. it, it's it's a learned it's a learned behavior uh, when you're working you don't get nervous when you're working do you get nervous before you turn on the microphone or the camera to do this show i do no. okay well okay I'm shy you, shy well <laughs> everything he said tonight has been a lie i just want everybody that's watching this to know he said he was banned from the show he said he's he's nervous and shy come on now I love it if you guys are having a little spat, a little quabble, a little, <laughs> you know, marital in a lot of problems here. What did he do? What did this J.R. Weaver do, Brett, that, that you're still harping on? Oh, he did. I don't know that he did anything. He's just always telling people that I, I was kicked him out of the show, but it's not I was, true. I was exiled from a show for a while because I had a, a bad headset that <laughs> it made all kind of staticky noise. So Brett was trying to sabotage your performance. Where's no, where's, said, where's, where's Miss Grimes? I know where is Ashley Grimes at tonight? Hey Bridge, I see you down there. Yeah. No, there's, I'm, I'm nervous. Still, I'll start speaking. Oh, good. Hi, Bridge. Speak oh. and she appears. There's hey. Ashley. Hi, Ashley. Ashley Grimes, AG time, AG time. Sorry, I was, I got involved in a phone call because I had five meetings today, and then um, I was supposed to call somebody, in, and I said around two, but it got, it was like seven something, and so I was like, oh crap, sorry. Want to ask Bridges' question? Does anyone or any social interactions make you nervous? Is that to me? Yes, uh, all of us. You know, I, I still don't like getting pulled over by the cops. <laughs> that's a, is, that, is that a social interaction? Yeah, that's a pain. And I've often said, I used to tell, because I worked as a drug counselor for a number of years, and I would tell my clients, lying is worse than using. You're lying is where, except to a policeman, but you shouldn't lie to anybody else, uh, except to the cops. <laughs> That's just my philosophy. Uh, you know, unless you have really great lawyers backing you up, and then it doesn't matter. <laughs> let's face it. Yeah, okay, I had, the, I had the best public defenders that money could buy. I had a, I had a, a, a paid lawyer in the book it's a great story when i got busted in philadelphia that our lawyer who was i think he was connected so to speak he says i can get you off and this was years ago so it was fifteen hundred dollars so it was a lot of money at that time he says i can get you off for fifteen hundred i said how do you do that he says five hundred to the prosecuting attorney five hundred to the judge and five hundred to me and you're off and when wow. i went to court my law, my the, my lawyer started to say something, and the judge said, "Hey, the less you say, the better." Case dismissed, and I was out. And it was almost like in Philadelphia, there was a menu of like how much different crimes would get you you could get off for. Wow! Because money seems to be a powerful uh, bakshish, or what do they break up? Bribe? You could bribe anybody. In Philadelphia, and that's one of the reasons I moved to California, because I believe Jerry Brown wasn't corrupt. Maybe he was, but he seemed to not be as corrupt as some of the politicians back where where I came from. Uh, I was told some of this the liberal cities seem like that it's, are some of the most like sleazy. Actually, like you'd think. They wouldn't be, but it's like you can. What do you mean crazy? What do you mean? I don't get it. No, like liberal, like places like Chicago and and New York and Philadelphia, yeah. like being able to pay people off. You wouldn't think you'd be able to in those places because crime's higher. Well, and there's, you know, but it, yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, I think it's it part of the system that was built in early on, right? I mean, it, it's been going on for a couple hundred years that the law enforcement works for the man 
and everyone's in it for their own personal gain. Hopefully that's not true everywhere. Hopefully that's not true. And I don't want to get into politics right now. I want to get into recovery. I saw I was invited to subscribe to a newsletter today and it said it's for people struggling with addiction. And I started thinking, how do, struggling with addiction, <clears throat> I can see struggling with sobriety. I can yeah. see struggling with recovery, but addiction was never a struggle. It was sort of a lifestyle. You know, you knew when you got up in the morning, you had a job to do, which was to score so that you could get high. You know, it wasn't a struggle. It was difficult, but I don't think people struggle with addiction. Like, oh, should I be an addict? Or Actually, it's a part in a book where I had started smoking heroin and it tasted like silk. And it was like, oh my God, this shit is really cool. Uh, and I was getting it from a friend of mine who was getting it from someone, obviously. And after like a couple months, I asked my friend, I said, could I have the heroin dealer's phone number? Because I thought, literally, I thought, I'm a, I, I think I want to destroy my life. I think I want to ruin my life. And he said to me, the greatest thing is, one of the, it was like a godsend. He said, oh, he moved away. And that made me say, okay, it's not meant to be. I won't ruin my life. I won't become a heroin addict because I heard it was not a good idea. You know, luckily, uh, either through films or my friends, I heard that becoming addicted to heroin was a lousy idea. Uh, so I luckily I chose not to. I mean, when I started doing cocaine, I did it every single day for 13 years, but I had it, I didn't have to steal for it. You know, uh, it, it got me into the hospital once or twice, but it was sustainable. It was sustainable and I didn't see heroin being that sustainable. Uh, and, and so I got, I got lucky, I got lucky, but I was only a Coke addict for one year. And that was the 13th year, because for the first 12 years, every time I did a line or a spoon, I did it because I wanted to. I wanted, I wanted to do it. I wanted cocaine in my, in my system. Uh, and I did it every single day, uh, but moderately, but every day. Uh, but in the 13th year, I would, I would think, I'd wake up and I think, I'm not going to do any coke until after dinner. And then right after lunch, I'd be doing it. I'd think, gee, I told myself I wasn't going to, and now I'm doing it. Or on a Friday, I'd say, hey, maybe I won't gonna, I'm not going to get high this weekend, which I know is a, a stretch. And then sure enough, Saturday afternoon or Saturday night, I'd be doing it. And I really started to feel like, oh, shit, I am a slave. I am in prison. I am trapped. And I don't know how to get out of this. And I didn't like that. You know, the analogy I used was like for years, uh, I had drugs like a puppet, you know, I was a puppeteer and I had, you know, I had cocaine, I had ecstasy and I had Percodans and I had Valiums and I had vodka and I had tequila and I would tell them what I needed them to do. You know, that, you know what the, but then that 13th year with the cocaine, I realized that the cocaine, that I was now the puppet. I was no longer the puppeteer. The cocaine was the puppeteer, and I didn't like that. Uh, but luckily, thank God, I realized that you can snort ecstasy. And so I was able to replace the coke with, with really high-grade ecstasy. It came in little capsules, and you could powder. And I still had to... And I can still use the razor. I think I was addicted to, to, the, to, the, to the ritual, the ritual of cocaine and the sound of the, the, the razor going through the, the, the crystals. It was like music. It was like music to me. So I was able to completely get off coke uh, by, I guess they call it a cross addiction 
or replacing one with the other. In fact, I think the author, uh, William Burroughs, said you can't stop an addiction. You can just replace it with another one. And I don't know whether going to AA meetings replaced my addiction to alcohol and drugs, but it certainly worked really well. It certainly worked really well. I did 28 days of rehab and never looked back because I could see use and die or go to jail. Don't use and be confronted with the unknown, which is just as scary for some people or for me, for anybody. The unknown is scarier than 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 the drama of of being a drug addict at that time for me, which I was used to. And when they say, "Oh, you know, uh, your life when your life becomes unmanageable," my life never became unmanageable, but I managed it like a drug addict. So it wasn't unmanageable. It was just it wasn't sustainable. That's for sure. Uh, is there another question? Are the viewers? All watching Netflix now. Did everyone? Oh, look. We had one question a minute ago. I have a question before we have that question. Oh, sure. Go so Ashley. I know you, you do a lot of stuff in the film world and stuff. We have a co host that's not here tonight because he lost his mom this year and it's her birthday tonight. But he has a dream of meeting Danny. Brother JR, how do you pronounce his last name? Do you have any connections that we could get like a Zoom meeting between the two of them or something like? That would be extremely unlikely. Okay. But um, I appreciate the sentiment. I know Danny through his manager. I don't have a relationship with Danny. I think if he saw me on the street, he would know me because we did an event uh, in December together. And so he met me then. I have a great picture of him holding up my book. You know, I call my new book my new, my new book promoter. But I don't really know him, and I wouldn't take those liberties because he runs a chain of taco restaurants. He has a chain of donut shops, and he's always making movies. This is yeah. one of the busiest men I've ever met. Uh, I wanted to meet him. I bought his book. I read his book. It's a great book. It'll make you feel like you know him. Uh, I have it over there. It's called Trejo, something about my life in crime in Hollywood. He was a hardcore gang member, drug addict, criminal. Uh, I read his book and I called his manager and I said, I would, and he lives not too far from me. I said, I'd love to meet him, and give him a copy of my book and have him sign the, his book for me and she said well he's been out of the country for two months and he's not coming back for a while the man has a schedule that would just you know even if uh, no but come to la he speaks at meetings he's very available to to the fellowship that would be the fellowship of narcotics anonymous and alcoholics anonymous uh so come to la come spend the week in la and find out where Danny's speaking. And that's yeah, not just want to write on a paper. Thanks, <laughs> Jason, for all you do for the recovery community. And like, I'd be, I think he'd be happy. <laughs> something, something. I, I don't know. I, I wish I could be like, oh yeah, you know. Uh, We're BFFs. <laughs> sure, he doesn't want to meet Ed Begley Jr. I have no idea. Okay, I do. <laughs> How about the great football player, Randy Grimes? Um, that's my buddy. Okay, so tell him to come to St. Pete's Beach. Get a tan and hang out with Randy. I mean, great so sober people all have a similar vibe. You know, they're happy to help the newcomer. As long as it doesn't cost money or time. No, I'm kidding. As long as, <laughs> as, long as, it's, as, long as it's convenient so to speak. And if he comes to LA, I'd love to meet him, but I haven't really helped him with his life yet. What's, what's his, what, what, what did you, why does he want to meet Danny again? He read his book and he thought he was inspirational. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. 
So. Yeah, he had he had just missed him in uh, Vegas. What was it this year mm, when uh, Danny season. came out to mobilize recovery? Uh huh. He does. I think he good. left the day before, and then Danny was like a surprise. Yeah. Uh, he spoke in an event that I do every year called the Experience, Strength, and Hope Awards, and he was very accessible to everybody that was there. Uh, and I know he speaks at some AA conventions from time to time, and he's very accessible i just don't have a personal relationship with him i'd like to but i think he's got his own posse (laughs) i I love randy though and he's got an awesome wife that is like an angel and the nicest person on earth so it's like if he wanted to meet randy that would we could work that out (laughs) does he watch this show is he is your friend watching this tonight or will he watch the archive? Maybe he's he's a co-host on he's just not on tonight because his family went to dinner for his mom's birthday. Oh he just texted oh, actually. Oh, oh, oh yeah. A birthday dinner is important. Oh, is he in the is he in the thread? Yeah, he just texted the group chat. Oh. And he said, Love you guys. Thanks, Jason. <laughs> and he's also um a host for um the way out podcast. Way out. Way out. Yeah, the way out podcast. There's, it's, it's a great, uh, it's a great time in America to be clean and sober, isn't it? It is. It is. I mean, it's uh, it's life changing, life saving. I mean, are we the chosen? Are we really the chosen people? We are the miracles. We definitely not are. the miracles. Did you see the report that came out yesterday? No. So they released the twenty one the twenty twenty one report SAMHSA did about s- substance use and mental health. Mm-hmm. Seven out of ten people that um, identified as having a substance use issue were currently in recovery. Um, so seven out of ten. So and then a one or no two and three that identified as having a mental health condition identified as in recovery. So it was like 20.9 million were in recovery from substance use disorder and 38 point something were in recovery from a mental health disorder. So seven out of 10 recover, maybe not the first time, maybe not the second time, maybe it's the 15th time they try, but to say. So in other words, there's no, so there's no, <laughs> alcohol problem or drug addiction problem in America because seven seventy percent oh no there's like fifty eight point something million million people using right now based on that report too like forty six percent of people eighteen to twenty six currently either have a mental health condition or a substance use disorder and one in three in adults. So I mean that it's there's people in recovery like so it's somebody that had a past issue identifies as in recovery. By the um, way, that SAMHSA report is on the addiction recovery e-bulletin this coming Tuesday. If you go to the website addictionrecoveryebulletin.org and you subscribe, you will get the report uh, that we're talking about. A lot of interesting statistics. Yeah, it's really bad. Like. Well, well, I thought you said seven out of ten people who are using are in long are in long term recovery. No, not that are using. So I'll get the actual. If you give me a second, I'll give you the actual. Yeah, yeah. Look at so, But but I'm the fifty eight point something million people have used an illicit substance in the last year. The the this the data was staggering, but at the end it talked about recovery, and it it showed that recovery is not. I'm not saying it's not a miracle that we found it. It's not, didn't change lives, but I'm saying that recovery with the right supports is probable. It's not rare. It's not rare. But would you say that what percentage of the people like me and JR and you guys feel like miracles, feel like we've experienced a miracle in our lives? You know, absolutely biblical, a miracle. I do. Oh, a majority. Not, so a majority. I want to say 100% because that's, 
you know, you never can say 100%, but in the 90s, a percent of people yeah. that have changed their lives believe okay. that it's miraculously that miraculous they could. I'm just saying the right. people that are struggling, struggling right now that don't believe recovery is possible and that recovery is rare, that's not what the data backs up. Uh, that's that's kind of interesting because like i think last year they the the data was like 25 million people were in active recovery now they're saying it's 20 million it was 23 and, something, yeah. yeah 35 million were in active addiction now it's 58 i mean that's uh those numbers are seem to be a little off well 50 or 46 percent of people 18 to 26 either meet the criteria of a mental health disorder or a substance use disorder that's almost half mm. that's a lot mm. you guys want to answer bridget's question i mean no i know leonard did with the police but uh what, what has been the biggest lie you became aware one. of after finding recovery that you were telling to yourself mm. the biggest how about yeah um ashley I think Ash is looking up statistics. Go for it. Go for it, Ashley. I'm thinking. I mean, oh, early early oh, recovery, man. early recovery. I, I used to tell myself to have my shit together, but I, I really didn't. <laughs> I think just that it's possible for me would be probably the biggest lie that I thought while using. I didn't think it was possible to live without drugs right. and alcohol. I mean, I think that's probably a pretty common theme amongst people in recovery is not realizing that it's obtainable or not thinking that you're worth it you know i i i have those beliefs about myself like i'm not i'm not worthy of recovery you know my you know i'm such a terrible person that there's no reason that i should you know have a happy life is that drug speaking or is that your 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 traumatic childhood speaking that's a good question i'm not sure i would say oh yeah i don't know you know what uh, Dr. Gabor Mate says? <laughs> We're all fucked. Excuse yeah. me. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> now you're good. <laughs> right. Uh, the biggest lie you became aware of that you don't, that, you, that I didn't need. I know one. And mine was that I could get better myself and that I could do it all myself mm. and that it, that was the biggest lie. I guess Connection. I was lucky. Yeah, yeah. I was very lucky. I never tried to quit. Uh, you know, I used to think a drug problem was meant that you couldn't get any. That to me was the definition of a drug problem. And I hit a bottom. I had a bottom. I won't go into it. Uh, it's a little too personal. And I drove myself to a rehab and never got high or drank again. Uh, because while I was there, I was sim sim not actually and symbolically said, you can go this way and go to jail or die and live a very mediocre life. Or you can go this way and you don't know what's going to happen but you won't go to jail and you won't die and maybe your life will improve. And that's because I heard that at meetings eventually after I got out the first night I went to a meeting and I, I heard a guy from a band called Deep Purple and, and he was a, been a crack addict uh, and he said something that made me think, oh, this is a better way to live. And isn't that what people are actually looking for, to be happy and healthy? Unless, no, I, I, I was shown a different way and I decided to take it. I, I decided to take it. Uh, I don't know if that addresses the question, uh, but anybody can quit. Staying quit might be more difficult if you have PTSD and you have nightmares and you have the, you know, and you, you know, I understand what that is. And that's why maybe some people 
relapse more than others. Uh, I don't know about the higher power thing. Nobody has mentioned the G.O.D. concept yet. Uh, I feel like that was part of my epiphany. Uh, you know, they say, you know, AA is incredibly dogmatic. You know, it's like you can be sober for 10 years, you have one joint, suddenly you're back to zero. Everybody else in your life would say, wow, that's amazing. You know, if you have one drink, you lose all your time. You don't lose the time. The time existed and you lived it and you were sober for that amount of time. So everybody else, your doctor, your drink, your family, your husband, your wife, would say, hey, that's that's cool. You know, you didn't drink for 10 years. You got crazy one night. You had a few drinks and you quit again. I mean, if you start using every day again, then you're just back on the treadmill or the rat, the rat wheel, the hamster wheel. Uh, but AA says, oh, no, you're back to one. Yes, we welcome you back and all that stuff. But people judge people who slip, I think. It's hard not to because you want everyone to be perfect. And when someone slips, maybe it makes you feel like your sobriety is in danger. If it can happen to someone, I like hearing people with 15 years or 10 years who've had slips because I have 28 years now. And I, I, I think, you know, I like to say when I was at the rehab, I came in on a train on this track. And I say that both as a pun. I came on, you know, the track, you know, tracks. I came on a track of drug addiction of every kind. My life was drugs. Uh, every day was about drugs because I was a dealer and I was an addict. And while I was at the rehab, the train, you know, on those turntables, if you've ever seen those old pictures of trains, you know, who have to change direction, they go in and they're on a, a turntable and the turntable turns and the train goes out on a different track. I'm on a different track. I don't think my train is going to jump back to the old track. Doesn't, doesn't seem, you know, I know anything could happen. I know anything could happen, but I really think once you make a vow to the Almighty that you're not going to drink or use, you keep the vow unless you have PTSD. Uh, I don't know. Nothing. It's all complicated. It's simple. It's complicated. Uh, I happen to love 12-step meetings. I didn't do Zoom, uh, Zoom meetings because I didn't think that was AA. I hope I get some shit for that, but real meetings, you know, and then the and the the, uh, the pandemic, you know, was, was very difficult for many of us. Uh, but I found a meeting in the park, an AA meeting in the park, and I started going regularly. So I had a meeting I could go to. Uh, I love human nature. Uh, I like hearing people's stories. It's very inspiring and uplifting and just to see people bear their souls in front of a room is fascinating to me and it still is fascinating to me other people maybe they don't care about other people maybe it takes a little empathy to stay clean and sober because i think the meetings are not a hundred percent necessary for everybody and those people that you say are you know in recovery you know Probably half of them don't go to meetings. They just got a job or they got a wife or, or a, something that made them realize they had to become mature. Maybe people just grow up naturally. Like you had said, you thought you could quit on your own. Did you really think you could quit using all drugs and drinking with no help? The gentleman on the left. Okay, well, I feel like I'm alone now. <laughs> oh, oh. Take the picture's off up there. Um, Brian, I, I mean, Brett, Brett, did you really say to yourself, I can quit using all drugs and drinking on my own? Oh, yeah, I, I tried it. You tried it? I was not successful. Complete but... abstinence, or did you hold on to one substance or another? Uh, I tried both. 
I tried I tried moderation. I tried holding on to one substance. I tried complete abstinence. I mean, I I feel like I tried everything by myself before I was willing to uh, get into a program and, and try something different. Did you end up turning your life and your will over to the care of a higher power? I did. What do you got to lose, right? Why not? Uh, you know, one of my biggest fears is I'm going to get to the pearly gates and whoever's up there is going to say, hey, you know, you really could have kept drinking. You weren't really an alcoholic. You were a drug addict. You know, all those years that you stayed abstinent, you didn't have to. And I would say, hey, asshole, I'm a, <laughs> I'm a drug addict, and alcohol is a liquid drug. It's a liquid drug. It's a drug. It's a liquid drug. And anything I take that makes me feel a little better, I want to feel a lot better, and I want to feel a little better all the time. That's why I smoke pot every single day for 26 years. Every day, 26 years, because uh, it, it worked. It, it worked. Uh, but then I got lucky. I realized nothing also works, or uh, nature works almost as well. It's not as easy, you know. It's uh, it's it's a lazy man's way to enlightenment. Is what they call marijuana. Smoke pot, you feel a little high. Well. Try something else. No more questions. Where is this audience? Are they mostly in the South, the Midwest? Are they in Costa Rica, J.R. Weaver? Because you have Costa Rica behind you. Do I? Yes. I hear there's an awesome rehab down there. There is. Costa Rica Recovery. It's I'm more excited. I will be back there tomorrow Perfect. night. Does it cost less than promises? It costs less than promises. Oh, yeah. probably so. I mean, we're probably one of the uh, the cheaper, with lower price treatment centers. Right. Affordable. I spoke, yeah. I spoke at a promises about a month ago. You were, now, you were in Malibu. You didn't look me up. No, I didn't go to the one in Malibu. It was pro it was five pal promises, five palms. So it was one of their their one in Florida. Uh huh. Daily ritual. It's a good one. It's a good one. Daily ritual. That's also a little personal, but hey, it's it's only the five of us, right? <laughs> <laughs> and Br Bridge M Sky. That's a cool name. That's a cool name. Ritual. Get up in the morning. Hey, there's sit. Justin. Sit down. Sit, I sit down I, and I chant for 15 minutes. I have an egg timer. I chant for 15 minutes. Uh, and then I do, and I light incense and I say to God, this, this sweetness is for you. You know, I, I offer the sweetness of the incense to God. And if it's the last sweet thing I do for you all day, forgive me, but here it is now. And I light incense, four sticks. It's a Japanese smokeless incense. It's delicious. It doesn't fill up the air and it don't turn on smoke detectors in hotels. Uh, and then I do a Japanese ritual of what they call do-in, D-O-I-N. Uh, do-in, it's self-massage, where I do certain things to my body, hit my head. My chest. It's wonderful. You can, there's books on it. You can look it up. Do in. I'm sure there's instructions online. I do that for 15 minutes. Oh, before I do the chanting, I read something, a, a thought of the day from a book by Yogananda, Maharishi Yogananda. I read a little thing in his book. And then before I do the Japanese exercise, I read the day's meditation and prayer from the 24 hour day book. The little black book published by Hazleton many years ago. I read that every single morning. Uh, my second year of recovery, I actually wrote it out every morning. Uh, so now after this many years, a lot of the prayers and the meditations are starting to sound familiar, but there's 300, 
and 65 of them. So I don't tend to memorize them. Uh, so that's very inspirational. And then I bow down in front of pictures of my, my ancestors, my mother, my father, my grandmother, my grandfather. I thank them uh, for doing what they did to bring me to this planet. You know, so I acknowledge my ancestors for giving me life. And then I look out the window and uh, try to have all the energy of the universe flow through me for a moment. And then I say something of a grateful nature. So, it's and, a then busy I, morning. and then I make toast, Ezekiel raisin cinnamon toast with sliced raw carrots every morning. So I get to have a raw carrot and a bread that allegedly doesn't have flour. Ezekiel bread. It's available everywhere. Maybe. I tried it. It's awesome if you toast it. Otherwise, it's unedible. That's not that bad. It's <laughs> Ezekiel bread. There's no flour. Uh, and... And that's that's my ritual. Brett, what's your ritual in the morning or at night? <laughs> or you go to bed? What do you do? Do you watch uh, Stephen Colbert or what do you do? Uh, my my current ritual is a little bit different because we have a, a newborn baby. So right now our, oh. our world is kind of turned upside down. And I guess I don't really have much of a ritual at the moment. Uh, but prior to to this happening my ritual was uh i did a little bit of journaling and stuff or if i wasn't able to get to the journal it just kind of depends on what's going on but uh at the at the bare minimum just to take a, a few minutes to do like a little silent meditation and then think of some things that i'm grateful for is kind of the bare minimum of of what i would say my ritual would be for either morning or evening just kind of depends on what the day looks like so you have a, a new a new higher power. This yep. big. This big. <laughs> so you're you're on his schedule or her That's schedule. Right. That's right. She is uh, cool. she's running the running the world right now. Uh, uh -huh. So I did find that thing. So it said seven out of ten. So se or like so seventy two point two percent or twenty point nine million adults who have ever had a substance use problem considered themselves to be in recovering. To be recovering or in recovery, two and three, sixty-six point five percent, or thirty-eight point eight million adults who ever had a mental health issue considered themselves to be recovering or in recovery. That's great. Hmm. So it's not that much of a problem anymore. Well, there was what was it? This other one is that uh, sixty-one point two million people used illicit drugs in the last year. That's not a problem. What's wrong with using illicit drugs? I'm serious. What's wrong with taking a Valium if you can't sleep? That's not illicit. It is if you got it out of your mother's medicine cabinet and it wasn't prescribed to you, that would make it illicit. Uh, maybe. Uh, I don't know. Is a It's a prescription drug is normally not illicit even if it's not prescribed to you. Illicit is normally illegal drugs. So is an Oxycontin illicit or not, if it was prescribed to you? It's not no. illicit? No. But it's more dangerous than, than marijuana, which is illicit, but not in California or half the other blue states in the country. And I don't think marijuana would be considered illicit if you have a medical card. I think it's only illicit in the states that it's not yeah, right. medically That's or, yeah. It's illicit for you, but it's not illicit for me because I live in California. Yeah, so I mean, there. So fifty, what is it? Fifty-two point five million people y use marijuana. So, well, a little less than ten million used other substances. And like I said, is what's wrong with using illicit substances? I mean, it could turn ugly real quick. But it doesn't turn ugly real quick for most people. Well, I mean, so 
46.3 million people aged 12 and older, 16.5% of the population met the DSM-5 criteria for having a substance use disorder. Well, so, I mean... They should take care of themselves. That's yeah, the I'm not saying if, if you, yeah. like there's necessarily anything wrong if you do it once or twice or whatever, but if you meet the DSM criteria... You know, and then, I say this not to piss people off, but like they said last year, 100,000 people died from drug overdoses. But how many didn't die? Maybe it was a million who didn't die. Well, I mean, it was 10 million who didn't. 51.2 percent of people used an illicit drug in the last year. 100,000 died. So, what? That's so. What do 51, the math? 51, 51 point something million didn't die. Not a bad average when you think about it. I mean, for the suffering family and the friends, it's a tragedy that that no one can even estimate what that feels like. I've lost a very close friend because she put a needle in her arm with coke and methadrine. Uh, we've all, not we've all, but many people have lost close people. But we all know a lot more people who use without dying. Uh, and is it a choice or is it not a choice? No, it's not a choice because your brain gets hijacked and you're doing something you wish you wouldn't. Uh, and it's, it's, it's a very peculiar, not peculiar, it's a tragic, what does yeah. Kalpermate say in his new book, The Myth of Normal? The Myth of Normal. So let me ask you a question. If you don't reach the DSM criteria of having a substance use disorder and you only used the drug randomly and not, is your brain hijacked? Or was no. It a no, it's not hijacked yet. There you go. So, I mean, it's, it's very gray. There's a lot of gray. And yeah. It's not a precise science. That's why I liked being a drug counselor because what applied <laughs> to this client did not apply to that client. You know, everybody's like a snowflake uh, and they have to be treated similar, but different. You never know. Unfortunately, fentanyl is making, yes. Yes. And, and a list of white powder or a pill that's not from a pharmacy could contain fentanyl, and that's how I think a lot of those people died. I think experienced heroin addicts are more careful because they love being heroin addicts and they don't want to lose that lifestyle. So maybe they're a little more careful, but new people are reckless. New people are reckless, and young people think they can never die anyway, you know, with their natural... They're, you know, people call them risk takers. I call them brave. You could call them stupid. You could call them assholes. But the parties where people are passing around drugs and you don't know what they are, but you take some, that's stupid. And you could die. You definitely could die from it. So um, less people are actually using heroin nowadays than are choosing well, to use fentanyl. I was talking to a woman and I want to declare that fentanyl has lessened the population of drug addicts and drug users in America. I was with a friend, she has two children, 20 year old, 22 year old college. They won't use anything because they're afraid there's fentanyl in it. So they don't do cocaine and they don't do white pills or yellow pills because they're afraid. So it has kept them from using drugs at all. And mm -hmm. some people think like Pamela, that many people don't care if they die. Maybe some people there is that, you know, Freudian death wish. Maybe some people are suffering and 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 think this might be a way out. I hope that's not the case, but it has to be. You know, you know, is it accidental on purpose? I don't know. It's it's it's. It's a tragic situation, and anybody that has lost a loved one will forever suffer the grief on one level or another, whereas the person that died is free. You know, they just sped up the clock of destiny.
because they were destined to die the day they were born. But so here's my question is that you're saying like, okay, only 100 million people died. The amount of people that didn't die is a lot higher, but these are preventable deaths. Like it's a preventable and a treatable condition. So a hundred thousand people died from a disease that seven out of 10 people. Well, we don't really know. We don't really so, know if it's a disease or not. I don't think people who take a pill at a party and die had a disease. But I'm just saying either way, the death is preventable. It wasn't, it wasn't, they didn't die of leukemia. They didn't die. You know, like it's, if they would have gotten the proper supports and learned, you know, coping skills that were different and had. I don't think a teenager who takes a pill at a party doesn't have coping skills. They're curious and they are invincible and they want to feel different. We all do something to do that, uh, you know, on one level or another. It's just a tragic accident uh, that young people overdose because they don't know what they're because they don't know what's in the drug they're taking. Uh, yes, every high school should have a drug testing device there, but they won't because they think that's encouraging drug use. You know, you, you know, same thing like safe needle exchange. Is that encouraging people to use needles or is it keep them from dying from AIDS or, or something else or hepatitis? It's, you know, it's, I love that expression. No, I love a lot of expressions. Uh, so, testing strips are illegal in our state. Testing and what? Testing strips and testing devices are, yeah. are computer yeah. paraphernalia here. So, like, yes, and it should all be government funded. A Sackler family should pay for every hit of Narcan or testing strips, and they should give them out free at every pharmacy, and they should be available at every high school. But they're not because there is no money in recovery except for the rehab. But otherwise, society looks badly on sober people because we're not acting out. We're not spending money on drugs and alcohol. We're not getting DUIs, thereby supporting you know, the local government with $1,000 fines. So I think the government is not in favor of recovery at all. And they seem to have a lot of power and a lot of money. So I think it's up to every individual and every artist and every musician to set a good example and to warn people that it's, it's, these are dangerous times. At least we're not being bombed, okay? At least we're not being bombed. Because those people are dying without any, they didn't do anything wrong. Not that using drugs is wrong, it just can be sloppy right? and, and stupid. And uh, right. anyway, uh, Speaking of drugs, I have to go eat food. <laughs> food, is my new, food is my new drug. Let's face it. You know, not I'm the, zero. Not that's mine. But food is a natural high, and so is sex. Let's face it. One of the greatest natural highs known to man. I mean, without it, I wouldn't be here. Let's face it. <laughs> without sex, I would not exist. Why is recovering out loud important? Because we're not shamed. Show addicts it's not a lost cause. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That's it. That's it. Anyway, I have a Facebook page. It's my name, Leonard Bouchel. Uh, chime in, do anything. Uh, get to L.A., contact me. Let's go to a meeting. Um, and J.R. Weaver, thank you for inviting me at the very last minute. Hey, thank you for, for agreeing to come on, man. I mean, you really saved us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I wonder. Okay. 
I appreciate your time, Leonard, as always. It's on the new baby. Thank you for coming. I mean, Thank you. Know, you. Be, be you, are the, you are the baby's God. Without you, baby <laughs> would not survive. Okay, uh, so take care of yourself. Nah, I think that's my wife. Uh, Ashley, you live in Florida, Ashley? I do. Oh, good. Okay. Great. Say hi to Randy from Leonard. Okay? I will. Okay. Bye, Joe. Bye. Talk to you this weekend. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Get the book. Hi. Confessions. Oh, there it is. Beautiful. It's very funny and it's very sexy. And there's a lot of pictures for people who don't like to read. Adios. <laughs> I like that. I like the pictures. Awesome. Well, thank you guys for tuning in to the show tonight. If you guys are watching us on YouTube, please be sure to subscribe to the channel. Turn on your notifications so you know when we go live, which is pretty much every Thursday night. But, uh, you know, we have some we have some nights where we don't don't uh, go live because there's things that happen last minute, you know, a little life on life's terms. So if you guys want to stay connected and see what's going on, be sure to join us over on the Recovery Revolution Facebook page. We try to keep you guys as updated as possible. Thank you, Mr. J.R. Weaver, for joining us tonight, even though he says he's still banned from the show, which is definitely not true. Ashley Grimes, always a pleasure to see you as well. Thank you guys for tuning in, and we will see you guys next week. Remember, progress, not perfection.